Welcome back to the neighborhood, boys and girls. Our next guest is Kevin Sacone from Keller Williams. Kev, welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you, thank you. So we normally start off with a little history question. Um, so I've, I've known you for a little bit. We've done some business, but tell everybody out there kind of about Kevin Sacone before the mortgage in, or before the real estate industry and how you got into this crazy business. Uh, so um, I started actually right out of high school. We were going to Drexel during the day and real estate school at night. Okay. I met my girlfriend, my wife now, in high school and we started dating and uh, she got a job at the local Remax office. We graduate, we serve on Drexel, these guys leave, start their own office. They want to put her through real estate school and they turn to me and say, like, listen, if you want to go get your license, I got to go anyway, but you're going to have to pay for yourself. At the time I was DJing uh, <laughs> a lot, actually. Um, and that's where it started. I was 19 when I got licensed. I was 20 when uh, I really hit the ground. Um, and I did really well, really young. Yeah. Uh, it was a great business. But back then, it was 2002. It was a right. different, different. That was, like, that was like three real estate lifetimes ago. You know, oh, you know, yeah. When you go through the timeline, that was like f four different markets ago and, for how it was. And in your business, like, you know, we, we, make, we make the joke, but you know that you did a loan for someone who was dead. Sure. You know, that because there was no verification of anything. Yes. Um, so I don't so, know about dead, but I definitely did a loan for people where I, I told them, I was like, you don't want to take this loan. You know what I mean? Like you're, we're doing a no verification loan. You're literally saying that you're a cashier at Pet Boys and you make eighty-seven thousand dollars a year with a fifty thousand dollar a year side business. You really don't want to do this because you're gonna. And they're like, ah, oh, no, we're good, we got it. Yeah, the, the interest only's and the arms and the balloons, cozies and, and all that yeah. crazy. Um, th that that was the, really the beginning of the end, and I was young and um, you know. When you do really young and you're young and you're immature, you know, I fizzed out real quick and um, then tried to revive myself and, you know, kind of fizzed out again and end up in the real world, quote unquote, in corporate. Uh, okay. I worked for Avalon Florin as okay. a salesperson. Uh, worked my way up through management. Um, I was there for almost a decade, which is scary. And 2014 came along, and I just got tired of it. It's like out of a movie where you just slur, like, you know what? I quit. <laughs> um, Who's coming with me? <laughs> literally, that's what it was, and I was the only one that walked out. <laughs> I, I took my, my resignation, and that was that. And, um, you know, when you're out for that long, literally, you start all over again. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so that's what it was, and uh, that's how we got here. Nice. And, you know? So. Nice. And do you have a, like, this is my normal buyer, or this is my normal client, or are you kind of, I got a little bit over here, a little bit over here, like, are you an investor guy, or a first-time buyer guy, or a second-home guy, or a step-up guy? No, see, I, I mean, I kind of think that, you, especially starting out, mm -hmm. you got to be everything, because right. you don't know where your business is going to come from. Okay. You just got to grab it as it comes, um, which is where I'm a big advocate of, like, knowing more than the average because if I know what to do with it, I can mm -hmm. take it and close sure. it. Um, first time home buyers obviously w was my thing, still is, I still am 50-50 buyer to seller, okay. um, which is rare, but I love buyers, I love the satisfaction. I think the referrals are probably five to one, six to one that I get from my buyers versus my sellers. Sure. Sure. Um, I think that interaction builds longer term relationships, mm -hmm. and I know that that's anti uh, what most people preach, but you know me long enough to know that I'm very anti what people preach. Right, right. For sure. I do my own thing. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that like buyers are more appreciative than sellers are. Oh, you yeah. know, especially, I mean, in, listen, in this market, most sellers think a monkey could have sold my house. It's really not that big a deal. And they're but, not buying right. either. I mean, let's face facts. Yeah, but a buyer's like, oh my God, you took me to 77 houses and yeah. We lost 27 bids and you stayed with me and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's, you, they are more likely to refer you because you also spend more time with them. Mm -hmm. When I have a listing, I go in, I do my listing presentation, I set up all my stuff, and then we talk a few times right. and that's it. Here, um, let's go over your offers. Yeah, really, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, let me bring in the offers. Um, the buyers, you get that interaction. You get to know more about the family and the kids and the aunt and the uncle and all that kind of stuff. And then you get invited to housewarming parties. and. It's just, it's a longer process, but it's become very rewarding. And, and 
you know, that's where my business comes from. Sure, sure. Just referral. Now, in your career, do you have like one client buyer that's been like your favorite? Like when you think about it, that's like, oh, this was my favorite one, or this was my heartwarming story that I had. <sighs> you know, I, I had. There's there's one there's two that stand out. One was the heartwarming one where she had an abusive husband, and I used to have to pick her up in a wig and a costume in the middle of the Walmart parking lot. Oh, because the husband uh, was a police officer in that town. Okay, um, that was rewarding because she was getting out of something. Getting away from it wasn't her fault, and okay. she, you know, and and of course, like there's a little bit of a fear factor in you. Sure, the person sure. You're yeah. upset, woman. <laughs> Don't want to make uh, a crazy policeman <laughs> with a gun angry, of course, number one. But like that was one of those things that you're happy when it's done and you sure. see the relief in her eyes. Right, right, right. Um, and then, you know, like my second client ever, um, I moved her out of Camden and uh, she was so thankful. And this yeah. was 2002. Right. I just activated my license in 2014. I didn't get back into 2015. My phone rings and I look down and I see her name pop up on my caller ID. And I, and I answer and, you know, what's up, Kevin? How's it going? Blah, blah, blah. You still doing that real estate stuff? I said, funny enough, I just got back <laughs> in. Now that you mentioned My nephew's looking for a house. And it just started from that call to the relationship with her nephew and he's probably referred me 25 deals. Nice. nice. Um, it's spider. I mean, it's, but it's so funny how sometimes like, the universe does something like that where you're like, oh, that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's, it's always like you never know who the person that you help is going to be the one that spiders or that gets you to that next level. You might help four or five people. You're thinking somebody, you meet somebody, you're like, that's going to be the one. Nah, that's not the one. It's the real inconspicuous one where it's like, poof, they open the door and, and there you go. And some of my biggest deals have come from some of my smallest. Sure, sure. Um, you know, that's the thing where now I'm one of the second generation, so, you know, statistics are every seven years. Right. They bought 2015, 2016, we're at year seven, so I sold them their first house, now I'm selling them the step up. Right. And then you saw them step up, and that carries, and it yeah. multiplies. And if you do it right, yeah, if you're good um, at your job. If you're good at your job. Right. And, 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 you know, that's, that's the whole, kind of the concept and same thing with your field sure um you know that is the same thing where it's everybody needs one right <laughs> let's right. be that person well, at a phone call like you said you know now nowadays everybody's half the people got cash they don't even need a mortgage anymore you know? <laughs> where it comes from i, I don't know idea. Is, i think somewhere there's like a, a counterfeiter that's got some you know atm machine that's just ringing out cash it has to be because three years ago everybody was broke four years ago everybody was broke they didn't yeah. have any cash we were doing state programs grants loans and and all of a sudden everybody anybody was... got any hundred ltv <laughs> you don't even have three and a half percent to put down you got a hundred ltv yeah. you know now like yeah we'll put we're gonna buy it for 200 we'll put down 185 we want a fifteen thousand dollar mortgage i don't know where it comes from but it's out there it's crazy it's but you know things are things are adjusting. I yeah. mean, we see that. You know, yeah. you see, you guys see it on your side. I see it on my side. Not that we've slowed down. It's just different. It's just different. I, we have a bunch of people here. We have like seventeen loan officers, but most of them are one year, two years. In the you have business. seventeen. Yeah. Wow. So it's impressive. Yes. It, it, it's 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 a nice little operation. Yeah. We got a great crew. But they've never been through this. So when when we're when I'm talking to them, we do our Monday morning sales meetings. When I'm talking to them, I can see the like the terror in their eyes. Like, oh my God, you, my phone used to be ringing off the hook, and now it's not. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is nothing. You don't remember when it was, blah, you know, this or that, or companies going out of business literally like the day of closing, and you're getting wires called back, and you know all that stuff. So you know, it's an interesting business it's a wild roller coaster it, it, it is and those people that did it the right way business will go back to where it was and i think that a lot of us in general in this field had become blinded by what the last two and three years were sure um and the, you become jaded because if you came into the business during that time frame that's what you think it always is sure sure um you know i when i teach you know their impression is that they can just come in and make a hundred grand mm -hmm. arbitrarily easy money and all of a sudden after 90 days of no money they go oh this is not easy right 
And now they come into this market where people are, you know, finding it even harder. So it's just, it's, it's different. And we all have to adjust to that. Sure. And those that don't adjust are going to get swept away, yeah, unfortunately. Of course. But it's what, it ha it's what happens. It's a cycle. It's a shift. Yeah. It's a shift. And this is the fastest shift that I can ever remember. I mean, you've done it longer than me, I think. Yeah. You know, in, in ge generally speaking, in the about, business. About the same time. Two, uh, 2001, 2002. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I've never seen it change this fast. Super quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it was not. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the teaching part of it, because you said you, you're, you're, you're kind of coaching, you, you're doing the teaching stuff. Talk a little bit about that. So, um, we were approached from um, Keller to take over this productivity coaching program. Okay. Um, and I've always, I came into the business, built a quick team, and then kind of regretted a little bit. I'm like, you know what? I'd rather work on me and build this the right way than having my energy go everywhere else mm -hmm. and work harder than everywhere else. Um, so the teaching thing, I've always enjoyed it. Um, I try to learn a lot of things from mortgages to home inspections. That I just want to be that guy. Right. Um, so we had a school out of Keller Williams. Once you're licensed, um, it's a lot of mostly newer agents, and uh, we have 63 students. I do uh, live classes. We have an interactive uh, platform online. Um, we do. Uh, daily group coaching sessions online, so it's it's pretty intense. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of cool when you see people um, selling that wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, we just eclipsed twenty million dollars in the first year of the program. That's awesome. In sales, just yeah. out of that. So yeah, it's 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 really cool. That's cool. It's, it's awesome. I know for me in, in teaching and mentoring, when you when you see that person that gets it. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you see the quarter drop and the fires in their eyes and then they're starting to actually practically apply the, the tools that you gave them and then they start to they start to kick a little ass. Yes. Then you're like, all right, there we go. Now yeah. we're on. And there. you might do that to ten people and one of them gets it, but that one is enough to fuel you to go, okay, where's my next one? Right. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's very cool. And 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 you know, it's one of those things that it's gratifying on multiple levels. It's not just a financial thing. But sure. It's, an, it's, it's just a psyche thing, you know, an aura thing, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I've had a conversation with like four or five different people about this specific topic. One of the things I notice is you can teach sales. I, I can teach sales. I can't teach work ethic. You know, you can find somebody who learns every single thing in the book and every single definition and knows how to do it and this, but then when when you look at them, you're like, mm, okay, now you got now's when you got to grind. There's always got to be some degree of grind to everyone, and that's what I found been the hardest thing to push on to people. It's not the knowledge. So and and. and you know, I say I can't teach sales because sales is either in you or it's not personality wise. Um, work ethic is a whole different topic because <laughs> you're percent right. It's you either got it or you don't. Um, very rarely do do people magically kick a work ethic one out of thirty five. Now, sometimes out of desperation right. they do. Yeah, sure. I think some of the best results in my personal life have come from some of the hardest times in my life, mm -hmm. right? For sure. Because you use that as your springboard, but that's not the general consensus. Right. Um, the technical stuff is where, you know, I thrive and I I try to teach that because if you know the nuts and bolts and you get a buyer, you get a seller and it's a difficult situation, at least you know how to put the puzzle pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, the work ethic, I, I can't tell you. People <laughs> just expect to like wake up at 10 o'clock and get you know, 10 messages, and, and for the last couple of years, guess what? That's how it's been. Kind of, yeah. That's yep. the scary part, is that the people that have become used to that, all of a sudden, I'm hearing crickets. Right. Because that stopped. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's talk about future, Kevin. Oh, let's go June, oh June of 2024. Where is Kevin Saccone? And give me a couple of bullet points or goals that you're going to hit between now and now. Um, I'd like... I'd like... 100 people in our program. I'd like to expand it to a couple market centers. Um, I think that the way we designed it, it has room to scale. To scale. Okay. I get the, the real estate sales numbers. I, I think if I can maintain or grow a little bit, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. I'm not looking to to do 100 million myself. Right. right. I, I I can do you know half of that. 
you know, with one person and be completely fine. You know, mm -hmm. so maybe maybe forty million in sales between me and one other person or two right. other people. Um, and this, you know, platform I think is where I want to push. Nice. And that's two years. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to be riding consistent here for a couple of years. I, I agree. I agree. I'm not a chicken little sky is falling kind of no. person. No, it's 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 not. It's not. And if you know statistics and you read and you follow trends you know that it's not the sky's falling. Yeah. You know we're exactly where we should be. Right. right. No one thought that the world was going to shut down for two years. That wasn't on anybody's bingo card. Right. But yet here we are when you look at where the lines should be, we're exactly where we should be. Right. It's, right. it's kind of crazy actually. Yeah, for sure. Um, that we were so far up to come so far down to come right where we should be. Yeah, we did. The COVID and, and, the, and the reaction to COVID was like the four-year correction, but it just happened in like 120 days. It pressed the fast forward button. Mm -hmm. I just discovered Instacart the other day. Yeah? It is life changing. I, mean, <laughs> I, get wall, I get like Wegmans to my door in an hour and if I need it quickly, it's $2 more. Right. And I don't have to drive there, wait in line, fight people over lettuce heads. Like nothing, it's all just there. It's amazing, yeah. but things like that have really blossomed and, and, and COVID pressed the fast forward button on the sure. inevitable, just condensed it like you Sure, when you, if you would have told people that you are not going to be able to go into the office and you're going to have to maintain your job and your production the way it is, 80% of the country would have been like, no way, there's no way we can do that. But when you were forced to do it, guess what? Everybody learned how to do it. And now you see all the, the shifts and the changes from that where places like New York City, where you had to live in New York City to have a job in New York City, now they're, they're scattering out there because they don't want to pay $4 million dollars for properties, they're going all over, and, and so many opportunities are going to come from that that coding. segment. Yeah, I, and I already see it. I mean, I've had several deals where they're either moving down here where they don't have to commute at all, or they're moving to the North Jersey region, and then their Jersey region is getting outpriced, and they're coming down here. Sure, um, but that that we've seen that for a while, and you're right. COVID made people think about things differently. Mm -hmm. Swimming pools. Yeah, swimming pools is always like the biggest investment that you made in your house that you got no money for. And now people are making dollar for dollar back what that pool was because of what it is. Yeah, for That's sure. All, you know? Awesome. All right. And then uh, we got one last one. Sports or music? Oh, boy. Um, sports. Sports, okay. So you wake up tomorrow and you can go to any sporting event in the past, and you can bring one person with you to witness the event. Uh, what, what sporting event would you go to? Can I pick music? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, probably the Eagles winning the World Series because we were we went to the parade. Okay. Um, there was no way I couldn't go to that. Okay. You know, 2017, uh, going yeah. to Minnesota. Okay. I, I think that that's probably the one thing that I, I if I, if I could because. I would appreciate it. If yeah. I was if I was eighteen, would I appreciate something that big? Right. No, I wouldn't. Right. Um, but that's probably the one. That okay. And who would you bring? My wife. Your my wife? Nicole is a die-hard football fan. Okay. She calls plays and knows things that like I look at her and go, "Wow, how did you know that?" <laughs> she has her own fantasy team. She does her own trades. Nice. Yeah, man. She's nice. she's deep. <laughs> right. Right. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Great. Kev, thanks so much for coming thanks, in. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. We'll be right back with the next guest. Welcome back to the neighborhood, boys and girls. Our our first guest of the night is Ron Edwards from KW Philly. Ron, welcome to the neighborhood. Pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, we do things a little bit different. We don't get too, too businessy here. Uh, talk a little bit about your pre-real estate life. Like, How did you get to this point right now? It's interesting. Um, Real estate is not one of those things where when you're in high school, when you're in college, um, you know, it's like referred to you as a job. You know, there's no steady paycheck. Um, that's probably the primary is no like, stability, right? You don't do it in school like, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a real estate agent. No. Nah. Like a policeman or a doctor or a fireman. No one says, I want to be a real estate agent. Exactly. Unless their parents are in real estate. But that's the thing. I went to school with a bunch of people, um, you know, who parents were in real estate. Okay. Like when you're a kid, you don't really care what your friend's parents do. Right. But, you know, as time went on, I realized how many people were in real estate. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I had a good friend of mine. Um, he was a realtor. And I had no idea what that meant. 
Zero. You can always see him, like, you know, showing houses and, you know, going to parties and hanging out and all that kind of stuff. But I had no idea what that career entailed. So he kind of put the bug in my ear then. And that was probably, like, eight or nine years ago. Okay. And um, I was actually working in a hotel at the time. More property management than a you know, hotel. And I'm like, okay, you know, I can see myself, like, doing this in a different way. So I guess, you know, right before the pandemic, um, I was, like, kind of satisfied where I was um, in my career. So I took a leap of faith and, you know, became a realtor. Nice. Yeah. Now, have you always been a hustler, an entrepreneur, uh, uh, a business person, or is this the first venture for you into that? It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, when I quit my hotel job, um, I tried to start a business. Okay. And the way people were talking be, talking to me about the business, they were talking like, "Oh, good luck with your side hustle." And I looked at them, "What are you talking about? This is my this was like this is my business, yeah. right?" Yeah. And uh, it, I failed miserably. I was it, I was really really bad. I was bad selling, um, but I I didn't believe in the product that I was selling either. Sure. But that was my first foray into uh, you know being an entrepreneur, and I learned a lot about um, what it would take if I was ever going to uh, pursue this kind of career lifestyle again. I would need better habits. Uh, you know, sacrifice, like the pain, and not, you know, being caught with the, the, the um, results, but falling well in the process, you know. Yeah. And I love the process. Yeah. Um, I think because I'm a little bit older than maybe, you know, a lot of other realtors when they start out, that I'm not um, discouraged by not seeing immediate results. Sure. But I like the process. I like I like the little ins and outs of, like, being a realtor, like, the, the grind, the grit, like not like everything, but right, I, right, right. you know, but I like enough of it that you know I'm not really concerned if I don't see something immediately because I know I'm doing enough of the right things that will sure. actually happen. The joy is in the journey, most correct? Of the time, yep. Yeah, awesome. So so far in your career, have you had like a favorite client or a favorite transaction that kind of warms your heart or you think of? Yeah, this and this is one, again, about the process, not the results. Um, I've been talking to this lady for like five or six months. She has the opportunity to like change her life with, you know, these three properties, but there's a lot of things involved. But, uh, you know, just like seeing her go from one point where, you know, she, she stopped letting people take advantage of her mm -hmm. and, you know, she's getting that confidence to like do things and, you know, making making the right moves and trusting me. And, you know, being patient with her has actually been a test for myself. <laughs> but I can see her doing a lot of things with these, these properties and, you know, just like getting her to the point where she has decisions. It's not necessarily about like selling or buying with her. It's more about like changing her life for her. Yeah. Like, and honestly, sometimes I don't even care if, you know, if I can't sell you a house or anything like that. Sometimes when you start, you start meeting people and getting under, understand them, like you more so want to have a positive impact on their life. Sure, sure. So you got to take that into consideration yeah. too. So if, if I always believe if you help enough people, if you do enough stuff, the the money stuff takes care of itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not. I mean, obviously you get into to have like some, like they say, financial freedom and flexibility mm -hmm. and lifestyle change and all that stuff. But I've never been motivated by money. You know, I like to spend it and like to have it, but it's not something that you wave money in front of my face that, you know, I'm going like, to compromise myself. Sure. You know, sure. so. Awesome. Now, how about your regular client? Do you tend to gravitate more towards first-time home buyers or investors, or is there a certain clientele that you find yourself dealing with more? Um, a lot of first-time home buyers. Um, I think education is important. My father was an educator, so I kind of feel like that's in my DNA. Okay. So there's a lot of conversation about you know what to do and like how this is going to impact you by doing that. So that education component is important for me, and you know obviously that draws um, first-time home buyers too. Sure. But um, actually, a lender that I met probably back in November uh, told me about you know a shift that was coming. He didn't really get into too many details, but he's mm -hmm. like. Look for more investor buyers. So I think now I'm I'm connecting with more investor buyers. Sure. It's particularly ones from New York. Right. Um, coming it's down. Yeah, I'm an analytical person by nature, so my numbers make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I do. I'm starting to gravitate more towards uh, dealing with investors and such. But yeah. You know, if you want to buy something, you want to sell something, you want to open a restaurant, you want to find a property that. You know, I'm game. It's yeah. all fun to me. Yeah. Investors are cool. Investors tend to be like. You know, splotchy. You get a, you get a lot of business in a little bit of time, but they don't really hang around too long. No. When you do the first time buyers, or you do 
the, the, the step up home market. You'll get them once, and then you'll get their cousin, and then you'll get their best friend, and then maybe you'll get them again in seven or ten years. So I know for you know investors are, are good; they serve a purpose, but uh, they're also kind of not many people that I did investor stuff for seven years ago are still doing that now. You know, what I mean, they sure. only like spend their money in two years and then they hold or they find something else or they focus on. Now, do you do any uh, commercial stuff? Are you ever finding like bars and storage units and laundromats and stuff like that? It's funny you say that. I'm actually working with a friend of mine who's looking to move his restaurant. Okay. So that's like kind of the only commercial deal that I've you know actively been involved in. So right now, we're actually in the process of finding him a location for his nice. restaurant. Yeah. I mean, I found the perfect location for him too. So hopefully, we get that sorted out. He hasn't. Realize that it's the perfect location yet, or I have vision. That's where I come in, <laughs> you, right? You have the vision. I, I showed him, but like, he hasn't seen no, your vision no. yet. No, no. I mean, I, I, you have to understand developmental patterns, uh -huh. like how how neighborhoods and areas grow. Sure, sure. Um, it's not by accident that you know they position these developing neighborhoods where they, where they are, right? Mm -hmm. There's certain commonalities amongst all these places. Sure. I see that stuff. That's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. The next part is getting him to see it. Right. Um, you right. know, and. That's the challenge. Yeah, it's That's a lot. Challenge. It's a, it's the argument that I had. I used to flip houses as well, and my partner in doing it didn't want to stage the house. And I was like, "Listen, you can't just have an empty house for these people to walk in because most people don't have the vision to see it how it should be or how it's lived in, and they just walk in and they see it. It looks like a vacant property. And staging was always so important for them because. You don't want to force them to think about anything. You want them to see your vision rather than have their own. Because most people don't have it. You know, most people don't see it the way. That's why we get paid when we get paid. You got to open your mind up. I mean, say you go into a house and you look at the house and like, oh, I don't want to buy that house because I don't like the handles on the cabinets. Right. You can change that, right? Yeah. So well, men wouldn't say. Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I do look at handles on the cabinet sometimes. I, I look know. at a handle on the cabinet too, but my thought process will be Home Depot has them for a dollar thirty two, <laughs> so we're good. We can buy ugly handles when we find. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Cool. So what about like let's go two years from now. We'll go into future twenty twenty four, Ron. What do you where do you see yourself in two years and what are some of your goals that you're gonna check off on the list between now and then? I wanna I wanna be more actively involved in, on the development end. Okay. Um, you know, we have a large responsibility when we're in the real estate business. We we literally can change spaces and communities. Sure. You know, um, you know, based on how we connect people with that home or that business. And, you know, even now, um, I have people coming to me trying to find places to live, you know, whether it be on the buy side or rental side. Mm -hmm. And it's really frustrating to see how expensive housing is, especially in Philadelphia. Yeah, sure. And I get frustrated, I'm like a little upset because, you know, people come to me with these ideas of like where, what they want to live in. Everyone, I feel like, is entitled to live in a comfortable, safe environment, you sure. know. And when people come to me and tell me what, what they can afford versus what's available, it's like, yeah. What can I do? They don't match up sometimes. Yeah, and you know, I mean, if I have the ability to kind of like change that, I want to be able to find that pathway within real estate. Nice. You know? So, in your personal expertise opinion, if I was like, tell me the one neighborhood in Philly that in two years is going to be much better than it is right now. I mean, you want to like name the obvious places, or like, yeah, I mean, like, what's, 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 the East Kensington is kind of already halfway done. You yeah, know what I mean, so like, I would like to say Point Breeze Grace Ferry, um, just because of the way the development is moving down there. Okay. I actually want to do a block party down there. I was talking to like one of my clients, and she told me not to do it because it's too dangerous. Yeah, and I didn't really click with me until I realized a lot of the businesses down there are not open past like 10 o'clock. Okay. I hope it's Point Breeze. Um, you know, I think there's a great dunk, ton of potential down there, especially with their Washington Avenue corridor, they're doing a lot of development down there. Um, you know, obviously Port Richmond is like one of those places too. Northern Liberties is already... Way down. Yeah, I mean, I remember when Northern Liberties, you wouldn't even go up there. Right. 
Um, Shars Wood up near like you know right in that pocket above Fairmount mm -hmm. near uh, Brewery Town. I think uh, you know Strawberry Mansion. I think in two years it's going to be it's going to be a lot better than what it is now. Um, I have my eye on to East Germantown. I don't know. Maybe. I was going to say East Germantown. Was... Yeah, I have like a thing about East Germantown. I have family from Germantown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm starting to like really dig in my heels and learn more about that area. Germantown's a weird area because there's like there's like pockets. You yeah, know what I mean, there's pockets of like these big old beautiful houses and some of them are dilapidated sure. but right next to something that was taken you know meticulous care of for a while and you can see that you don't need vision because you can see what it could be you know yeah i mean i'm just reacquainting myself um you know with the area like east germantown and like germantown where you know like off like like, like uh was it green lane and you know all those like it's, there's there's like million dollar homes in there, mm -hmm. and then you go to East like East Germany in particular, you have like ninety five thousand right, dollar homes, right? right? But it's positioned well. I mean, it's Mount Airy. Um, they actually are, they have a magnet high school out in that area. Um, obviously, there's a lot of good like prep schools and such. But I mean, it's an interesting area. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it has a lot of potential. It's That's just it's just it's, just it's a very like they don't want those outside forces to come in and disrupt what they have in that area. So. Um, you know, you have to be sensitive to that, but I think it could work. Yeah, I, I think it could work. I don't think it's a target for gentrification like Fishtown or anything like that. I think the people that live in Germantown now, the longtime residents, are not leaving. Correct. You know what I mean? Like, you see the, the a lot of the people that lived in Fishtown 20 years ago went somewhere else. I don't think Germantown or a lot of parts of Germantown are going to have that. I think they might just, from within... Reintroduce it. I don't think you'll see uh, um, an exodus like we do in Fishtown. You're seeing a lot of people coming from New York, where they had three million dollar houses, and now because of COVID, they can work at home and they're selling their three million dollar house and moving and getting a one million dollar house and loving it. So I don't think it's that, but it's, I think it's an awesome area for appreciation, especially in the rental market. You know, what I mean, yes. for, for for long term rental properties, it's not. I don't think it'll ever be, you know, bottom. You know, it, I think where the low end is is where it's at now. So. Yeah, and there's like a large chunk of the population between 55 and 75 year old, so they're they're not really going anywhere. Right. Unless they decide like the to retire for it. I don't think people in general. Right. Like, <laughs> no. But um, I think it's just one of those places when you look around, like the historical value of it. Sure. Um, it, it gets like overlooked. People want to go to Mount Airy or East Falls, but like Germantown, you know, I I think. I think you could do something. I, I was at a church in Germantown one time. I won't tell a big long story, but there was this sign on the on the church, and there was a cemetery there, and it was like this famous Baker General, which I don't really even know what that is, but there was a person who was ransacked in the Revolutionary War and killed there, uh, and it was like literally the, the, the tombstones were from 1775. And I'm like, man, you just don't get a lot of places where you can touch the ground that something really special yeah. and historic happened at, you know what I mean? You don't picture that there, you know, like if you're on the, you know, whatever, you know, some of the battlefields and stuff like that, but you don't think of like, oh wow, that was here, you know, and it was like on the spot, I forget what the guy's name was, but this is where he was murdered and killed by the Hessian troops and then they came through and did this big onslaught and wound up winning this battle. But it was just like, man, you, that's real history, yeah. you know, it's not like, you know, in some museum that's right there. I say like I feel like I'm Indiana Jones sometimes when I go out in the field. Um, because I, it's like it's like I'm going on an adventure, going to all different parts of the city. Um, places that, you know, I never thought that I was gonna be in mm -hmm. and situations that I didn't think I was gonna be in, but it's like it's always exciting. And to your point, you know, there's like a lot of history out there in all parts of the city. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning more about the city than I probably would look otherwise. Sure. Just because I have to know that. And also, I want to, too, you know? It's good. All right, now here's your personal question. You could have an interview half an hour with anyone, alive or dead, throughout history. Who would the person be that you'd want to sit down with and interview for half an hour? Pick their brain? Wow. That's a tough one. I used to do play this game, like, alive or dead. So, like, take two people alive and train for someone who is dead. Just because. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. I would have to say, I like to sit down and talk with Jackie Robinson. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like me and my friends the other night, we were actually talking about like we had like a like a um, like a you know, like March Madness, like the, like the 
64 greatest Americans of all time, like mm -hmm. who would be seated where? And like we always kept coming back to Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Like Jackie Robinson is always like at least the number one seat. Yeah. So it'd definitely be Jackie Robinson. He's an amazing person. Yeah. I would I I don't know how true you know, it was so long ago, but like the movie Forty two. I don't know how true to reality that was, sure. but I've seen interviews and talked to other people, and just the amount of pressure and stress that was put on him, and the way that he handled it so gracefully, and it was not his person to really do that. Like yeah. he was a hot-tempered person. He was someone who would strike back, who would defend himself, who would fight. And he just understood the moment that he was put in and like forgot about all of his personal stuff and just said, I got I got a duty, I have to perform. And that's amazing, you know? Yeah, it makes you think about how you conduct yourself on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, you know, about self-control and like being aware that it's not always about you. Yeah. Which is like kind of like, I, I think for personally, you know, that's something that, you know, evolving. I understand it's not always about me. You know, you have to have some level of empathy and compassion for yourself, but also like what you do, how that affects everyone else. Yeah. So the fact that he was able to do all what he did, pretty yeah, impressive. It's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. Look forward to talking to you some more. Absolutely. We'll be right back with the next guest. Welcome back to the neighborhood, boys and girls. Our next guest is Jocelyn Aponte from Honest Real Estate. Jocelyn, welcome to the neighborhood. Oh, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for joining for us tonight. Me. So we start off and we do a little bit of stuff. We like to talk about the people, not just the business, right. the people. So give a little history of Jocelyn before the real estate business and how you actually got into this. Because most people, when they're in school and they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most of them are like a doctor or a <laughs> policeman. No one's like, yeah, I want to be a real estate agent, unless your parents are real estate agents. So what, what happened that got you into this business and what was what was Jocelyn like before before this? Well, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, before I became a real estate agent, I was actually in the Army. Okay. Um, active duty. Um, I was in the service for about seven years. Okay. Um, but once I hit that um, six-year mark, you know, um, you know, things get old and, you know, you, become, you be, start to become unhappy and you're like, this is not what I want for my life. Mm -hmm. um, real estate was always something I was interested in. Um, but it finally clicked when I had when I bought my first house and had a bad experience. Okay. So we won't talk about. Yeah, the we won't no, get. We won't, we won't talk about the person, no. but. <laughs> we'll talk about fight club. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just um, I wasn't happy with my experience, and it really just wanted me. It, it made me want to do different, like so. I tried. Was to, it a thing where it was like it was motivation for you to do it, or was it something where you said, "Well, if that person can do it, I know I can do <laughs> right. this." You know what I mean? <laughs> um, I was looking for a new avenue. Um, really, like I said, like HGTV. I watched HGTV growing up with my mom, so mm -hmm. real estate was always our thing. Um, she she wanted to become a real estate agent. She never actually became one, but. Um, when that happened, it was kind of my motivation as well. So okay. It was like the kick in the butt. Nice. That I needed, so. Now, were you military combat? Were you overseas? Where were you serving? No, or? actually, um, so I was was called Active Guard Reserve. So it was okay. kind of like I served here in the PA. Um, but okay. basically, at the state got um, at the state got um, called active for some okay. reason, like the riots. I sure. was activated for that. And okay. That. Um, also, I'm just working on the base. I'm um, doing the normal everyday things like taking care of the soldiers and sure like sure that. so i now, was based out of pennsylvania because of your military background do you do anything for veterans soldiers or anything like that in real estate any organizations any groups that you're a part of i do um it's great because i got to tie them together because i realized being in the military that not many of them you know have homes or even sure. educated you know a lot of a lot of people join the military and they're um they're young, you know, mm -hmm. they're in their younger years and they don't really understand and they're, you know, used to either going away and being away or being home, you right. know, with family, so not really having their own space. And I think that's important. So I do try to, um, uh, um, you know, my battle buddies, I call them, um, they see me, you know, buy houses and then they get curious and I try to hold seminars, just cool. really open with, with other veterans. Nice. To help them. Now, in the, the current market, the way things are, have you had any problems getting VA loans accepted or 
know, a lot of people, depending on the areas, a lot of people, like yeah. conventional only, but you serve a couple different markets, so it's not always as tough. So it's, some of the other neighborhoods are okay with VA loans, you know. It's very unfortunate, honestly. Yeah, for it's, real. It's, it's, not like, a, it's not a... The concept that people have of VA loans is, is quite sad, and it's, it's really not fair, I right. think. But um, I try to help a little by, like, personally talking to the other side, the other agent. Sure, sure. Like, you know, this is, you know, a, you know, well qualified, you know, having the my thing is having the lender reach out to the agent mm -hmm. and letting them know how qualified they are right. and kind of put in a good word for them. Sure, sure. That always That's helps. Definitely we do that. And it's crazy. The only thing that I don't ever have a hurdle with with VA loans is the fact that they have their own appraisals. So right. that's what you that's the feedback that that we get sometimes that's an over uh, an objection that's really tough to overcome because there really isn't an answer that I can right. say. Yeah, that's the case. Uh, you know, I can't say you know for a VA loan we don't control it. For FHA or conventional, we have our own appraisers. Right. We do like this. So, you know, that's the thing. But sometimes, you know, we'll have, I just had one where the, the guy put ten thousand dollars in escrow, even though he probably only needed like seven thousand dollars. He got a refund check at, at the closing, but at least that made the seller feel like he was a, a, a qualified buyer and there wasn't going to be any problems right. with, with the transaction. But it's crazy the way people in this market treat VA loans. It's like worse than FHA. I'm like, wow. I know. Okay. And, it, and it's sad, but before I even show my VA, my VA client um, a house, I actually reach out to the agent. Like, are they, are they open to VA loans? Right. Because I don't want to waste any of our time, right? So. Yeah. And you don't want to you don't want to waste your own time. You also don't want to create that negative experience exactly. of going to see a house and then fall that you in can't have. Yeah. Then they can't have it. Yeah, because so. then if if that happens the first time, then nothing's ever going to measure up to that house, and now you're just fighting an uphill battle. Right. And, you know, you, you yeah. don't want to walk into that. I definitely so, try to avoid that. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have? We, we talked about veterans. Do you have like a client base that you think that's my person? Is it first time buyers? Is it investors? Or are you kind of just jack of all trades? You know, it's your weird. Service, it's everything. weird yeah. because um, I actually just got my license in New Jersey. Um, it's only been about six months, but okay. lately all my business has been in Jersey. I guess so. I guess it was like people waiting for me because I've always said since I got my license in that I would get get it in Jersey. Right. You know? And next Delaware. Okay. <laughs> um, right. I would love to be tri-state, but um, a little bit of everything. Um, I I invest in my own properties. Um, okay. So I have a few. So I a lot of people come to me for advice, and I usually help them um, with multi-families and investing like that. Um, first-time home buyers, I always hold hold first-time home buyer seminars okay. to kind of you know drag people in the door and keep you know business growing. So that helps a lot. Um, so I kind of do a little bit of everything. Okay, nice, nice. And do you, are you pretty active in like any of the groups? Like you see a lot of investor groups and there's a lot of, tend to, to have like, you know, either seminars or get togethers with other investors. And no, I wouldn't say I'm that type of investor, more like starting off, like people who like okay. who are interested in starting to invest in real estate, stuff gotcha. like that. Not necessarily experienced um, investors who need to use their, um, you're not like a portfolio yeah, no, investor kind of person. No, that's, really. that's, I, I, I like that better anyway. Yeah, I like I like more personal. I like being more personal mm -hmm. with my clients, like people that's really going to matter to them. Too. Right, right. It's pretty cool to have somebody buy their first investment property and then it kind of clicks on them. It just happened like, to me the other day with my okay. client. It was amazing. Yeah, I could do a couple of these. And then, you know, when you explain to them, you know, look, if you do these and you still have a 15-year mortgage, you know, if you're if you're 37 right now, and 15 years are going to be 52. If you pay these all off, now you have five rental properties that are paying you your mm -hmm. cash flow. You don't have to worry about your 401k. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about what happens in the stock market because that can fund pretty much your whole retirement. Yeah, it's crazy how the the regular person either doesn't ever think like that or doesn't think it's possible for them. They, they think exactly, it's for other and it's both, yeah. I actually, yeah. I actually just helped my mother um, purchase her first investment okay. property. So All right. she's, uh, she's, trying, she's starting to get in the swing of things. They're really starting to understand. A lot, a lot of times people don't understand the benefits sure. of investing. Have you done any like large scale multifamily stuff like 40, 50, 60 unit? No, properties? I have not. Um, my biggest sale actually was this year was 1.1 million and it was um, eight units. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that. 
What about commercial? You dabble in any kind of restaurants? Or? That was a commercial. Okay. Um, so twice, I had, I've had two transactions in the last four years. That okay. Was commercial. Nice. I don't dabble in it too much. No. Nah. Okay. So we went backwards. Let's go forward now. Let's go June, July of 2024. Where is Jocelyn? at and give me a couple of the goals <laughs> you're going to check off on the list between now and then man it's cr um let's see um i currently have i'm starting to invest in properties i currently okay. have three okay my goal is to double that okay um um help my mom get a couple more i would love okay. to do that for sure for sure <laughs> um what else um I mean, I'm really just focused on really like building, building my brand and what I stand for, and just kind of letting that flow for itself. So, okay. That's um, I do. It's out of, out of. I have other plans out of real estate as well. That's gonna be my next question. So good. <laughs> that's where we go. All right. So now, your heart, your spirit. What do you do outside of real estate? Outside of the nine to five? What do you do to warm your heart? To excite you? To to, to motivate you? I'm a dog lover. Okay. All <laughs> I'm right. I'm a dog lover. Um, I love all pets, but really dogs. Um, so my next goal actually is to start a doggy daycare. Okay. I would love to. I saw a picture. You were doing something for. Was it an animal shelter? Or was it there? Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I got to donate to an animal shelter yesterday. Um. I got to present the check to them. Um, nice. Yeah. So. Nice. So doggy daycare. What? That. That's like a. a like just a regular check in in the morning come pick them up after work kind of thing yeah but I kind of like i kind of want to coincide with um a animal shelter like something you know for families who can't really afford it like you know less mm -hmm. i guess you know the the price is being more reasonable than normal doggy daycares okay and any uh any nonprofits, organizations anything like that that you're involved with that are uh, the women's an animal shelter yeah okay. that i got to donate to yesterday yes okay that's yeah. awesome all right, so now we're going to go with your personal question. Sports or music? Damn, that's tough. <laughs> I love music. Okay. I'm part of right, music. So we'll go with music then because you love music. All right, so you can have any band, artist, singer, whatever it is, come to your house and sing two songs. <laughs> Who's the artist and what are the two songs that you're going to have them sing? It could be anybody, alive or dead. From the fifties, from the thirties, or right now? <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, good question. I would probably say. I would probably say Eminem. Okay. Love Eminem. Eminem. Love Eminem. Okay. <laughs> Which two songs? Um. Lose yourself. Okay, for sure. And. Uh, um. Gone. Okay. I, was, <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. That's, so you gave me like six different answers that totally were not what I was expecting <laughs> the answer to be. I'm thinking, I'm okay, I, I know where this is going. And I know where this is going. Wow, wow. Awesome. Thank you so That's much, Jocelyn, awesome for so coming in. We'll be in touch for sure. We'll be right back with the next guest on the Mortgage Neighborhood.